floodwaters continue to rise across the region. Thunder Bay Atacokan candidates square off. And details of the Pope's upcoming visit to Canada. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Riley McManus. A flood warning is still in effect in the Thunder Bay area. Water levels rose again overnight, bringing the two-day total to between 34 and 50 milliliters, depending on the location. Though the latest from the region's conservation authority states that those water levels continue to decline and will further reduce throughout the weekend. Additionally, a number of highways in the northwest remain closed due to flooding. In the western reaches of our province, the city of Kenora has issued an evacuation order for residents north of the bypass for all roads north of Fortier Bridge. An evacuation centre has been put in for residents who need a place to stay, and city crews are working to secure a corridor for safe exit out of the area. Residents have been asked to gather their belongings and evacuate by 6.30 this evening local time. After that, there will be no exit or entry. With flooding wreaking havoc all over the region and the ongoing evacuation of Kasheshwan and Fort Albany, another First Nation is also under a state of emergency. High water levels during the spring ice breakup have damaged the water pumping station in Martin Falls, leading to issues with their drinking water. Lee Noonan has more. The pump station that supplies water to Martin Falls was destroyed by ice that came much farther up the bank than normal. Water levels have since subsided and a temporary pump has been assembled that is now feeding the community's water treatment plant. And Chief Bruce Achnipaneskum says half the battle is won, but he says the water quality is still unsafe. Children and some of the members started breaking out in, in rashes and sores due to uh, use of uh, that uh, untreated water and uh, you know part of the reason why we declared that state of emergency was to uh, actually uh, ask for an evacuation of the of the uh, most vulnerable population of, in our community. Achinipaneskum says they've received no firm decision on whether there will be an evacuation. He expects to hear something on Monday. In the meantime, he's advising residents to boil all their water and seek medical attention right away if needed. You know, the nurses up there do a, a remarkable job, but uh, we don't have doctors in the community uh, readily available, and and uh, we're not able to see them. Uh, we have uh, doctors that come in maybe uh, once or twice a month for very short uh, periods of time. But uh, this is an urgent matter, and uh, you know we're looking to have our people that are afflicted by these conditions treated. Grand Chief Derek Fox says the crisis in Martin Falls is one of many throughout Nan Territory, and that it's typical for slower moving problems like water quality, mental health, or even COVID to get a slower response from government. But the slow, the slow ones are the mental health issues. So this is almost like okay, well, no one's really dying you know yeah you, yeah you might have uh suicides you might have s someone losing their life to covid but for some reason those those situations are not taken as serious right and uh it, it's it's left upon the community to to um deal with it oftentimes Achni paneskum says it could take months before a new permanent pump station is built and weeks before the situation stabilizes enough that water quality is restored to previous levels which were still not potable. The community has been under a boil water advisory since 2005. Lee Noonan, TBT News. A murder trial is set to begin Monday for one of the two men charged in a local homicide case. It's the first criminal trial by jury at the Thunder Bay Courthouse since the start of the pandemic. 26-year-old Jonathan Massacott is pleading not guilty to second-degree murder in the death of 32-year-old William Wapoose. The victim's body was found near a walking trail in Chapels Park in September of 2014. City police later offered a $50,000 reward and two suspects were arrested in 2019. Massacott's trial is scheduled to last two weeks and at least 10 witnesses will be called to testify. The other accused, who was 17 at the time, will stand trial in October.
The party leaders are out pushing their platforms today, ahead of the televised debate on Monday. And as Siobhan Morris tells us, there are now questions about another Liberal candidate. The party is already two candidates short of a full slate, with the nomination deadline come and gone. The Liberal Party is again facing questions about a candidate's past, this time words from the candidate for Etobicoke Centre in a student newspaper in 2004, diminishing the difficulties faced by the LGBTQ2S plus community. Until I know the, the sort of, you know, what's behind those and, and whether or not they are in fact a true representation of what was said, I, I'm not going to comment on the specifics. Yesterday, Liberals terminated a candidate for using a homophobic slur online within hours of learning of it. The Ontario Liberal Party that I am leading is an ally and will stand in support and in solidarity with Ontario's 2S LGBTQ plus community every single day of the week and proudly so. In Windsor, PC leader Doug Ford faced questions about former cabinet minister Parm Gill, who in 2015 talked about his opposition to same-sex marriage. It's the first time I've heard of it, so I can't comment on that. But I can tell you one thing, he represents the people of Milton, he's a great minister, and I look forward to him uh, moving forward with our government. In his home riding of Guelph, Green Party leader Mike Schreiner highlighted a plan to double ODSP payments. We are asking the wealthiest in our province to pay a bit more so that the most vulnerable in our province no longer live in legislative poverty. All four leaders are gearing up for a rematch with a primetime debate on Monday night. What this debate is going to do is, is give folks a chance to, uh, to really analyze, I guess, or hear from the, the leaders and, uh, and, and hear about our plans. So how does Horvath get ready? I mostly spend time thinking about uh, the, the kinds of things that people tell me they're concerned about and how to, you know, how to best uh, articulate that. Things like the cost of living and hope for the future. Some of those vying for the Thunder Bay Atacocan seat at Queen's Park had a chance to make their pitch to voters last night. Candidates from the NDP, Liberal and Green parties participated in a debate hosted by the Thunder Bay and District Injured Workers Support Group. Vasilios Spellos reports. The debate saw incumbent Judith Monteith Farrell representing the NDP, along with newcomers Eric Arner for the Green Party and Liberal Rob Barrett. Progressive Conservative Kevin Holland and the New Blues David Tomasini were not in attendance. Healthcare and the pandemic were quickly addressed by the candidates, all criticizing the Ford government's response and explaining how their party would move forward with the issue. The lessons of SARS and we had recommendations from that and when we were faced with this pandemic, we found out that the things that were supposed to be in place were not in place. We will permanently increase lab testing capacity and stockpile rapid tests and PE, PPE, as well as build a pandemic resilience hub. Hiring a lot more nurses, and uh, that's something that should happen right away because we know that uh, COVID is still around and other variations could come around. The trending topic of housing, particularly affordability, was discussed. All candidates stressing they would make it easier for those looking to buy or rent. 138,000 new deeply affordable homes, including supportive housing and homes for Indigenous peoples. To use public land for to make permanently affordable housing, build 182,000 new permanently affordable house, uh, community housing units. Uh, rent controls were uh, removed by the Ford government, and that is something that needs to be uh, put back in place. The next debates for the Thunder Bay Superior North and Thunder Bay Atacocan ridings will be held by the local Chamber of Commerce. Vasilio Spellos, TVT News. The nomination period is now closed for the upcoming provincial election. Here in the Northwest, there are plenty of candidates to choose from in most ridings. Two have a whopping eight names on the ballot, and another has seven. Ryan Bonazzo has the rundown of all the area candidates. Starting off in Thunder Bay Superior North in alphabetical order, Adam Cherry is running for the Consensus Party. It's Shelby Chung for the Liberals, Stephen Huffnagel for the Ontario Party, Tracy McKinnon for the Greens, Kathy Sutari is running for the New Blues, Lise Vaugeois is the NDP candidate, Andy Wolfe is for the Northern Ontario Party, and Peng Yu is running for the PCs. In Thunder Bay, Atacokan, Eric Arner is running for the Greens, it's Rob Barrett for the Liberals, Dan Krieger for the Ontario Party, Kevin Holland is running for the PCs,
Kenneth Jones for the Northern Ontario Party, incumbent Judith Monteith Farrell for the NDP, and David Tomasini for the New Blues. Over in Kenora Rainy River, Kelvin Boucher Chicago is with the New Blues, Larry Brayland is with the Ontario Party, Joanne Formanek Gustafson is running for the NDP, it's Richard Jonasson for the Consensus Party, Catherine Keevening for the Greens, Anthony Leake for the Liberals, Janine Seymour is running independently under the name M'Ajaquan, and incumbent Greg Rickford is running once again for the PCs. And in Kiwetanung, Alex Dorn is running for the New Blues, Suzette Foster is the Green candidate, incumbent Saul Mamakwa is with the NDP, Manuela Michelisi is with the Liberals, and Dwight Monk is running for the PCs. Ryan Bonazzo, TBT News. A rally looking to highlight the treatment of workers in long-term care took place today. National Uniform members were on hand as they called out the provincial government for not addressing a lack of staffing in the field, with high rates of burnout among their workers. Jessica Clement has the details. Around 70 people took part in a march in support of workers in the healthcare field and outrage over the way they are being treated by the province. Beginning at the Friendship Garden, ralliers made their way to Hogarth Riverview Manor. That's where multiple speakers voiced their displeasure, calling out the Ford government. Get left behind. Our health care workers are going to feel the strength of all of Unifor as we come together. Local Unifor president Kari Jefford raised alarms over the high burnout rate in the field since the pandemic began. She wants members of the public to be aware of Bill 124, which has restricted public sector workers to a 1% increase. They're working double shifts for months on end. They haven't had any vacation time off because they don't want to walk away from their residents and their patients. Um, but the, the, that is not sustainable anymore. This has been an issue for 20 years. This, what we're seeing in the pandemic has really sh shone a light on what's been uh, happening in long-term care uh, and throughout health care over the last so many years. Unifor officials say the public should remember this when going to the polls on June 2nd. They hope Ontarians elect a government that not only says they care about the health care system, but one that will act on their promises and make things better for the workers in long-term care. We know we can do better. We know that those residents deserve better care. And we know that the conditions of work are the conditions of care. They go together. We don't, we don't fix one without fixing the other. The, the workers who've been through this humanitarian crisis want nothing more. They're only here because of their love, their respect for the people that they care for. But they can only take it so much. The burnout rate is incredible. Unifor is Canada's largest union in the private sector, representing over 300,000 workers. They feel that healthcare workers are not getting the respect they deserve. Our union has had enough and we're not going to take it. Our union is going to mobilize, our union is going to use the strength that we have across all the sectors that we represent and we're not going to take it anymore. So Doug Ford and all of these employers need to take message of the fact that Unifor is not going to stand by and let this happen. We're going to support our healthcare workers across the entire province of Ontario. Jessica Clement, TVT News. A $1 million funding stream could soon become available to help reduce homelessness in Thunder Bay. Administration is recommending three strategies for Council to look at, including increased advocacy and changing the focus of another funding stream to align with poverty-related projects. The largest part of the file is an $800,000 increase to Community Partnership Fund, bringing that up to $1 million. Local organizations would be required to leverage funds received from the city to get more from other levels of government for all large-scale projects. The memo from administration comes as a result of a December request from at-large councillor Mark Bentz. He was inspired by the tent encampment situation at County Fair Mall to explore other ways the municipality can address what technically is a provincial issue. We can do more to help them. And, and I think everyone knows that. It's just trying to find the best way to help them. I think this is a good uh, step forward in terms of that we'll be using dollars that we can leverage with other programs and actually attract dollars to the city to help more people. The idea would be that the projects that are coming through the Community Partnership Fund perhaps already have either agreements or potential um, opportunities to apply for funding at either the provincial level, the federal level, or through um, foundations or different resources that they are connected with. Benz has heard that one of the biggest needs this fund can help with is transitional housing. If approved, the funding program will be in place next month.
Another person has died with COVID-19 in our region. It's the 91st COVID-related death recorded by the Thunder Bay District Health Unit during the pandemic. There's also a new outbreak at the Hogarth Riverview Manor long-term care home, this time in the Birch Grove resident area. The health unit is also reporting 108 new cases since its last update on Wednesday. There are now 274 known active cases across the district. There's one additional case at the Regional Health Sciences Centre today. There now are 38 COVID patients in hospital. Three of them are in the ICU. The occupancy rate at the regional is 100%, while the occupancy rate in intensive care is nearly at 73%. The province's top doctor is forecasting a calm summer in Ontario when it comes to COVID-19. Dr. Kieran Moore, however, notes that Ontarians have to remain vigilant and take advantage of the protection that's now available. Austin Delaney has more. Some encouraging words from Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health. I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll have a better summer. And that has people making plans. I plan to go to lots of patios and come down here for walks and hopefully go up north. I'm looking forward to a great summer. I'm still a little worried about it, so we take it day by day, but we are planning to get on a plane and go to New Brunswick. For summer plans, it means I'm going to get to go and visit family out on the West Coast uh, in June. And uh, my family who's on the East Coast are going to come and visit us here in Toronto. So it's great that people uh, feel that they can travel and move around. Dr. Kieran Moore says the numbers are heading in the right direction. COVID found in wastewater declining, as well as the test positivity rate and the number of people in hospital. I have to attribute all of this to Ontarians coming forward and maintaining their protection from immunization. We know the protection fades over time uh, and at around five, six months, uh, our protection against severe outcomes decreases uh, significantly. Uh, and so all Ontarians have to step up, come forward, uh, stay up to date with their vaccines and stay protected over the summer. Peel's medical officer of health says people must remain vigilant and get vaccinated. We know that with the Omicron variant circulating, uh, there is still a significant risk uh, of severe outcomes if people haven't actually gotten uh, all the doses that they're eligible for. He says the pandemic is far from over, and if you are traveling, make sure you are protected. Well, that sure does get me excited for the summer. And speaking of summer, Fiona, it was so nice to see that sun today after that crazy thunderstorm we had last night. Yeah, two nights in a row, uh, a very misty and uh, gray start to the day, but the sunshine came out this afternoon. We had a low of 10, a high of 17, which actually is uh, right on the button for this time of year. That is our normal uh, daytime high for uh, May the 13th. Winds were relatively uh, moderate, uh, 9 to 22 kilometers per hour from the east, so they were a bit on the cool side. Other parts of the region also enjoying sunshine to the west, but temperatures much milder. We've got a much more southerly flow in Fort Francis at 23, Atacocan at 24, 26 in Uppsala, and 24 in Dryden. It's a bit cooler as you head into Kenora and Red Lake. They're under mostly cloudy skies at this time. So look out at 23 and definitely some cooler air to the north, pushing uh, temperatures down into the high single low double digits for Pickle Lake and Big Trout Lake. To the northeast, we've got a lot of cloud in Greenstone and Armstrong. Marathon at 22 and Sault Ste. Marie currently at 29. Uh, that's not the high for the day, though. In fact, they hit a record 30.1 degrees this afternoon. Uh, that's uh, far and away above the record for this time of year, so they're enjoying the sunshine and definitely summer-like conditions. Here in the city of Thunder Bay, though, we will be dropping down to a low of 8 once again uh, tonight under a fair amount of low cloud. And the weekend, well, it'll be a little bit of hit and miss depending on where you are as the system that brought the thunderstorms continues to try to track its way out of the region. I'll have more details on that later on in the news hour. Thank you so much, Fiona. Well, the Pope announced today that he will be making a visit to Canada in the summer in July, and we'll have those details for you when we come back. Pope's visit will provide an opportunity for him to listen and to dialogue with Indigenous peoples on this land.
the Vatican confirmed today Pope Francis will visit Canada in July, traveling to two provinces and a territory. The Pope's visit will provide an opportunity for him to listen and to dialogue with Indigenous peoples on this land, to express to them his heartfelt closeness, and to address the impact of residential schools here in Canada. The pontiff will visit from July 24th to the 30th. He'll be based in Edmonton, Quebec and Iqaluit while visiting Indigenous communities. The papal tour follows his apology last month during meetings with Métis, Inuit and First Nation delegations at the Vatican. They hope he'll also apologize on Canadian soil, but the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations will not greet the Pope when he comes. Roseanne Archibald says his itinerary doesn't include any First Nation territory where the suspected remains of children were found. Residents of a Northwest Territory town remain out of their homes after being ordered to leave due to major flooding. We evacuated the entire community of 3,500 people and uh, we're, we're still trying to assess uh, the full damages that have occurred. Hay River sits on the south shore of the Great Slave Lake, just north of the Alberta border. The evacuation order went out Wednesday night when ice breakups started to jam, causing water levels to rise. Most people have left, some are choosing to stay, but everyone is accounted for. Those who are staying behind are being asked to conserve water, with water treatment offline. Residents in southern Winnipeg aren't getting a break from the flooding. The Red River is expected to crest very soon, possibly today. Jill Mackishon has more. In southern Manitoba, they're extremely high. We're talking about roads and fields that uh, in some cases have a meter of water on them or more. Um, and that's because the Red River just couldn't stay in its banks this year. We had a very, very uh, snowy winter, I think the third snowiest on record. And then we dealt with storm after storm after storm after storm uh, over the course of the last month or so. So a Colorado low that kept blowing through here every week, uh, dumping in some cases, uh, I think we had about 50 to 60 millimeters of rain in the last storm. But this one that actually blew through here last night uh, lost a lot of its steam at the international border as it crossed into Canada. Uh, so we didn't have the, the rainfall, at least in the southern Red River Valley that we were expecting, uh, but it is still hammering parts in central uh, and western parts of the province, as well as the east, uh, where the city of Kenora in northwestern Ontario is also dealing uh, with an, a local state of emergency right now. Another twist in Elon Musk's bid to buy Twitter. The billionaire now says the $44 billion deal is on hold, but he still plans to get it done. Musk tweeted that the deal is temporarily on hold pending details on spam and fake accounts on the social media platform. Government debates can often become heated, but in the BC legislature this week, there was a much ado about a soon-to-be I do, a wedding proposal that shocked politicians, viewers, and the woman who was asked. Binder Sajjan tells us how it all came together. Member for Port Mordico, Kirtland. Just before question period, Rick Glumack stood up to ask one of his own. I'd like to acknowledge one person in particular, and that is my partner. Haven Lerbecki, who is off camera, thought she was in the house to hear the MLA make a statement. Instead... I just have one question for you. Um, <laughs> will you marry me? <laughs> Through applause, Glumak got his answer. I think that was a yes. He then left the chamber to deliver the blue diamond ring. He really got me and just over the moon excited. I was nervous for sure. I mean, as a, you know, doing this in a, in a public way like that. Glumak says he's been planning for weeks. Looking back, his new fiance says there were signs. At what point did you realize it was a proposal? Uh, the minute he stood up and started to talk about partners, I think. Because again, I, he had told me it was about a, a festival or something like that. So I knew something was up. The premier tweeting his congratulations, writing, I have always said that watching legislature proceedings is engaging television. It's one of the few times in question period that a question actually got answered. So... Uh, <laughs> Becky says she always wanted a unique ring. Lumac did one better with a proposal like BC's never seen before. Binder Sajjan, CTV News, Victoria. A baby formula shortage south of the border is getting worse by the day. Not find it, but when we do find it, it's there's always a 20% markup on it. 
Parents are on the hunt for baby formula, as short and long-term problems are affecting supply. A recent recall and COVID-19 related supply chain issues are to blame. U.S. President Joe Biden said yesterday that he's working to make sure there's enough baby formula to meet the demand. The North American stock markets rallied today to close out a volatile week. Let's take a look. The TSX added 400 points, reaching 20.099. In New York, the Dow gained 466 points. It's up to 32.196. And the Nasdaq jumped 434 points to 11.805. The Canadian dollar gained more than half a cent, reaching 77.2 cents US. Gold lost $16, falling to $1,808 an ounce. And oil is up $4 to $110 a barrel.